The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 5696 in the name of Nigel Dawn on Scotland's butchers lead the way with quality produce. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible and I would further invite members and indeed members of the public who are leaving to do so quietly, please. I now call on Nigel Dawn. Seven minutes, please, Mr Dawn. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to be able to bring this motion to the Parliament in the context of the event which I was able to host in the members' restaurant on Tuesday, which I know many enjoyed. That was an opportunity to celebrate our farmers' markets, and as I consider each of the businesses which was represented, I think I should be able to draw some lessons. Let me start with the butchers. This motion was, as many will know, put down in the wake of the horsemeat scandal and the observation that our local butchers were benefiting substantially from the loss of trust in our supermarkets. I think all butchers saw an increase in trade and it's my understanding that some butchers have seen a significant and sustained rise in turnover since. Turning to those who were here on Tuesday, Hebby Fowley from Burt Fowley Butchers in Stricken recognised that now that he had seen new customers in his shop, it was up to him to keep them coming back because there is no doubt and no doubt in his mind that in time the supermarkets will fight back. Adam and Dawn Marshall from Reva Country Foods breed, fatten and butcher their own pigs and then cure and smoke the bacon and ham. And their business demonstrates the benefits not only of minimising transport but they are also able to retain all that added value in their operation, a theme to which we will return. Community farms were represented on Tuesday. Gorgie City Farm here in Edinburgh is as much an educational experience as a working farm and has inspired young and old for the past 30 years. I must confess I found their collection of chicken and dug eggs most interesting, not least because they varied enormously in size and colour. And I have to say that their sausages were very good too and are clearly recommended. Whitmere is an organic farm in East Lothian run by Robert Cruz and Heather Anderson which is in the process of becoming a community benefit society in order to preserve it as a place of research and education in sustainable farming. And I think the Cabinet Secretary is already well aware of this particular enterprise but I think it's another of an example of the kind of thing that we need to be promoting across Scotland. This clearly has benefits. Whilst on the subject of education I also note the work of Ian Spink who was down from our growth. He produces organic smokies and can be seen at agricultural shows, again, demonstrating the process. And I have to say, there's little better than a fresh smoky, certainly in fish. Two bakers were with us on Tuesday. Alan Brodie from Salt Eye Patisserie found his cakes were very well appreciated. And I have to say that his haggis flavoured bread was also perhaps a bit of an acquired taste, but is apparently in demand as a novelty. Uh, also, his magnificent salt iron cake is going to be enjoyed later this afternoon because it is still in one piece just at the moment. Karen Hay and Katia Labar from the Wee Boulangerie in, in Edinburgh here demonstrated that their range of breads, uh, that it's possible to, to, to run a successful small business even in these difficult times if you produce quality products and those who sample it will know fine well the quality of the products they produced. The St. Andrews Farmhouse Cheese Company was represented by Jane Stewart. Now, they've been expanding from simply producing milk, which, as we know, is not a particularly profitable activity, into cheese making and are supplying a number of local outlets. This allows them, again, to generate the added value and retain it within their business. It also reduces food miles, which is a subject to which I'm going to return. Tani Gill from Affineur Fromagerie is clearly passionate about Scottish cheeses. His message is that we should eat our own rather than import. How could one disagree with that? But in order to do that, we will need to raise awareness of our local products within Scotland. And I suggest that is one of the tasks where government can help. It's really quite difficult for a small business to do that nationally. Isla Gillen represented Kenamore winemakers who use local fruit from the Council of Gary. And their winery also has a restaurant making the visit a doubly pleasurable experience. Paul and Victoria Miller came from St Andrew's Brewery and gave us samples of some very acceptable beers. It's a great pity this event was at lunchtime because I think if it had been in the evening, I might have enjoyed rather more of that beer or been safe to do so. I certainly enjoyed it. It has to be. 
John. John Mason. Uh, I thank the member for giving way. I didn't realise we were going on to the alcohol side as well as butchers, but that's good. Uh, does he share my disappointment that when people come to receptions in this Parliament, be it in the evening or lunchtime, they get, do not get Scottish products by way of either wine or beer? Nigel Don. The, the, the member's disappointment. And I do think actually there are some lessons to be learned from what has happened this week. I mean, I think it just begs a few questions that people might like to, to come up with you know, the answer to. Um, if I can just carry on, though, the, with St Andrew's Brewery, because I think the point was that the most interesting part for me of the story that they had to tell was the whole process is kind of local. You know, they use locally grown, locally malted grain. The spent is then returned to local farms, either as fertiliser or as feed for local pigs, which then finish up on the table of the restaurant, where, you know, in the pub, where you're drinking the local beer. Now... It seems to me, presiding officer, that's an example that, that sums up what farmers' markets have potentially to teach us. A couple of centuries ago, what I just said would have been wholly unremarkable. In fact, people would have wondered how you ever did anything different. In the last century, we've been through a process of intensifying farming, cheap transport, and we've moved an awful lot of stuff around for reasons which we well understand. We're now beginning to understand that there are significant disadvantages of that approach and recognising that we cannot afford to move farm food around and we do not need to. So I think that is one of the overwhelming messages from the experience of setting up what happened and I'm sure we'll come out further in the debate. We're going to go back, I think, and we should be trying to go back to a time when we do think about what we can produce locally and eat it and produce it, because it actually ticks all the right boxes. I really must mention, though he wasn't able to be here, Bruce Brimer, my local butcher in Brecon, simply because it's absolutely excellent stuff that he produces. I want to thank everybody who came along. I'd also like to thank everybody who produces local food in Scotland. I recognise the government has been very supportive of our food industry. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is going to tell us all about that. But I recognise that. This is not a criticism of the government. And I do look forward to hearing contributions from other members to this debate. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Claire Baker to be followed by David Torrance. Around four minutes, please. Um, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in this lunchtime's debate and congratulate Nigel Dawn on securing the slot. In many ways, this is a timely debate, not least because Nigel Dawn hosted a very successful farmers' market in Parliament this week. It was an excellent example of what Scotland's local producers have to offer and a good opportunity for MSPs to talk to stallholders about their business and the passion they have for their produce. As well as welcoming the two stalls based in Fife, the Eden Breweries and the St Andrews Farmhouse Cheese Company, I spoke to farms which had diversified into running farm shops and selling their own produce direct to their customers. I also spoke to the butcher stall, who had a fantastic model. They are supplied by a local farm, they have butchering on the shop premises, and they can tell customers exactly where the product is from and how it has been produced. Complete traceability and quality. For the modern shopper, a butcher's shop or farmer's market can be intimidating. If you're used to pre-packaged produce, customers can be wary of the mental arithmetic that's involved in calculating weights and kilos, particularly if they're going into that store and they're price conscious. The butchers I spoke to recognise this and they work to make the produce as clearly priced as possible, accessible with friendly service. And for people who've always shopped like this, which includes, you know, I remember as a little girl going into a butcher's with my mother, but it's, um, my experience has been much more supermarket focused like many of my generation. Um, this might not seem relevant, but if you've only experienced off the shelf, it can be intimidating to go into a shop and ask for a pound of sausage without knowing what that actually looks like. So there are opportunities for butchers, and although we've seen the number of high street shops reducing, in recent weeks there have been reports of increased footfall, and many are now also promoting online sales, which is a smart move in today's market. Uh, my granddad was a butcher. It was a trade he learned from leaving school, and it was a profession until he retired. And it, at the time, it was an essential skill, and it meant that during the war, he was home, and his contribution was made in a different way. It was a highly regarded skill, and there was a lot of pride in the work. And in a move to much bigger production over the years, there have been concerns that some of this has been lost. But I think there is, or is at risk of being lost, I think there is now a greater commitment from many small and big retailers to recognise and nurture the skill of butchers, and that is to be welcomed. 
Uh, the motion also mentions the horsemeat scandal. These shocking revelations could be a catalyst for a national debate about our culture's relationship with food, how we eat and what we eat, how these decisions are made at both an individual and a corporate level, the impact these decisions have on our local and national economies, our nation's health and environment. Um, last year I heard a held a members' debate on Five Diets Food Manifesto, and given what we now know about the impact of the supply chain stretching across Europe, the scale and potential for food fraud, the treatment of the consumer, this is a good time to have the wider debate. Um, in preparing for today's debate, I did a bit of research. And now, if we ask, is the quality of meat higher in many butchers, is the supply chain shorter, are there potential environmental benefits to more shopping locally? Undoubtedly, these, these are all true. But if you look solely at price, what challenges does that present? Um, a pound of pork sausages, roughly 400 kilos, at my local farmer's market cost me £3.24. At High Street Butchers in my region, a similar weight of sausages cost me £3.18. In a big supermarket, while they offered a range of differently priced sausages, a pound of their own brand pork sausages cost £1.38. Now, there are economic challenges being faced by many families across Scotland, and if you're on a low income, choices have to be made. Now, I know that compared to other European countries, we spend less of our household income on food, and an argument can justifiably be made that people should buy less meat but of a higher quality, though that often tends to come from commentators who are having to make that kind of choice. But I fully accept there is evidence that, uh, to suggest that a cultural shift would be a good thing in terms of supporting local businesses, improving their environment and people being able to eat better quality produce. But part of that debate must be about how we ensure low-income families aren't excluded from us meeting that challenge. Thank you very much. I now call on David Torrance to be followed by Alex Ferguson. Thank you, President Officer. I'd also like to thank Nigel Don for bringing this motion to the Chamber today. The recent horsemeat scandal has resulted in one of the biggest changes in consumer habits for many years. A survey of Quality Meat Scotland revealed that, in February this year alone, 92 per cent of craft butcher shops experienced an increased footfall following media coverage of the horsemeat issue. In the week ending the 9th of February, many butchers reported sales uplifts of between 10 and 25 per cent. Many customers are visiting their local butcher for the first time, seeking reassurance over both the supply chain and the quality of their meat. Craft butchers, of course, are in such a position to provide these reassurances. In Octo Tool, in the Kirkcaldy constituency, one such butcher has been going from strength to strength. Puddle Dub Pork is a family business sitting at Clentree Farm, at east of the village. Run by Tom Mitchell and his sister Camilla, whose grandfather Harry came to the farm in 1905, Puddle Dub Pork was established in 1999. As the name suggests, the company is predominantly based around pig farming, and the Mitchells take care to ensure that the pigs enjoy the happiest of lives. The animals are allowed to grow slowly, been given the care and attention they needed. A pig consultant makes regular visits to ensure that every stage of welfare is at the highest level, and the pigs are fed home grain, grain from the Mitchells themselves. Transport the animals to a short journey to the abattoir, meaning stress is kept to a minimum. Clentry Farm is also home to Puddle Duff Buffalo, which is run by Tom and Camilla's nephew, Stephen Mitchell. Stephen runs his herd of water buffalo, Aberdeen Angus cattle, and a, a flock of Jacob sheep on the grassland. And there is also a freshwater loch which is designated as a site of specific scientific interest. The Mitchell's physiology is quite simple. The belief to produce food low miles hasn't been shipped halfway around the world. It's tastier than, than it produced that has. It is hard to argue with this, especially when a longer food supply chain can result in sc scandals such as the horse meat issue. The Mitchell's and many other local butchers regularly sell their food at farmers' markets throughout Scotland including at Kirkcaldy on the last Saturday of every month. Kirkcaldy's farmer market has now been running in the town for 12 years. It sets up in the square outside the town house in the centre of the town, making it easy to access for local visitors. Farmers' markets are a great way for producers and consumers to cut out the middleman, and there is no exception in the Kirkcaldy's case. A range of suppliers include typically meat, fish and dairy produce, fruit and vegetables, preservatives and beverages. Many local butchers have stalls at the market, with the likes of Hilton Wild Boar, Dalachi Beef and Lamb, and Sirius Good Venison setting up alongside Puddle Duck Pork. The Fife Ambassador Christopher Trotter regularly visits to provide cooking demonstrations. While the Kirkcaldy Farmers Market was in danger of closing a year ago due to a lack of business, an appeal 
for more people to use it resulted in an increase in footfall and an extended support from Cut 5 Council. By July, new stalls had been, given to, been added to give customers more variety, and now 12 months on, the market is stronger than ever. This is a clear indication that the market is valued by both customer and traders, and Five Council's confirmation of support is a further welcome boost. The obvious benefit of farmers' markets is that farmers can produce and sell direct to customers, and the abundance of farmers in Fife makes markets such as one of Kirkcaldy the shortest and easiest route possible for producers and consumers. By responding to appeal for more business, customers displayed that they do value the reassurance of knowing where and how food has been produced. This can only be done by speaking to farmers themselves. Further benefits of farmers' markets include the reduction of carbon footprint and the ability to, to keep local economies healthy, and these are both vital measures of success in a modern Scotland. I applaud the work of Puddle Pork and their fellow butchers and will encourage customers everywhere to visit both farmers' markets and local butchers as often as possible. Thank you very much. I now call on Alex Ferguson to be followed by Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And like others, can I start by congratulating Nigel Dunn on securing this debate. I am delighted to take part in it, coming as I do from very close to the town of Castle Douglas, a small market town which still maintains four butcher's shops in its high street. Presiding Officer, in typical Scottish fashion, a great deal of humour emanated from the horsemeat scandal. I particularly like the campaign that Dumfries and Galloway's Savers the Flavours initiated, uh, producing a logo that stated nay horsemeat here, nay being spelt, of course, N-E-I-G-H, to promote the fantastic butcher shops of my home region. I also understand that one enterprising Edinburgh entrepreneur started selling horsemeat burgers with the absolute guarantee that they contained no trace of beef whatsoever. You cannot beat the Scots when it comes to raising a smile in the face of a serious situation, presiding officer, although in this case I think it was made all the more acceptable as the one certainty that did exist throughout the horsemeat scandal debacle was that there was no danger to human health. Nonetheless, the scandal blew a gaping hole in many previously held convictions. The conviction that the meat we buy on the shelves of our retail outlets, particularly the processed meat, is exactly what it says on the label. The conviction that the traceability of our food is foolproof. The conviction that we have a trustworthy and robust regulatory regime. All of those fundamentally very important convictions in terms of consumer confidence have been blown out of the water by this scandal. And to my mind, one of the saddest aspects of that is that um, it has left many of our primary producers, our farmers, wondering why they have had to spend fortunes as the first link in the food chain to conform to a traceability scheme that they believe to be robust in order that the consumer could have complete faith in the product that he or she was purchasing. The farmer, as much as the consumer, has been badly let down by this shambles. Now, one of the most amusing results, I think, of the scandal was to be seen in the unseemly rush by the major supermarkets to source their meat and meat products locally in the wake of the horse meat scandal. For years and years, everybody, including the Cabinet Secretary and others involved in the industry, has been encouraging them to do just that, to support local producers and through them to support the local economy. And for years and years, those pleas fell largely on deaf ears. But one scandal, almost certainly caused by the supermarkets' constant downward pressure on the profit margins of their suppliers, and suddenly they can't get enough local produce. It's almost laughable. And yet, through all of this scandal, as I think the motion today before it exemplifies, and indeed the many other food-related scandals that have gone before this one, the ongoing comforting and reassuring high street presence of our local butchers and the steady rise and expansion of the farmers' market network, both of which were superbly represented here through Nigel Dawn's hosting of the market in the members' restaurant yesterday, have maintained and promoted the superb quality of Scottish produce and kept it available in front of for the consumer. As many others have said, presiding officer, this is about food miles, it's about traceability, it's about sustainability, it's about quality, and if I may suggest, it's also about trustworthiness and faith in our local produce. I'm delighted to support the motion before us. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now I call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. A lunchtime debate certainly makes me feel that it is lunchtime. Um, and with all the talk of food, Presiding Officer, it certainly is encouraging my appetite. I too would like to congratulate Nigel Don, and certainly uh, for the people that attended on Tuesday. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to sample perhaps the local brewed beers, uh, given the queue that was there at the time. Uh, I was, as I say, moved on to perhaps sample the bread instead, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Presiding officer, we've got much to be proud of in Scotland with our butchers, and certainly in my own constituency of Aberdeenshire West, we have some of the, 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 the best butchers, I would say, in Scotland. To um, probably give you the flavour of why I say this, presiding officer, A and G Colley of Kemney won the Scottish Country Alliance Award Butcher Award for the year. But against all adversity, A. G. Colley won this award because his butcher shop had been burned down. He produced, he got a, a porter cabin, continued trading. And then he was burgled just before Christmas. But in, but in light of all that tragedy that befell this particular butcher in Kemney, A.G. Colley, he ensured that every customer's Christmas order was there and delivered on time. A worthy, worthy person of the award by the Scottish Country Alliance. We also have... Gary Rayburn of, of uh, Huntley, again, young butcher of the year last year. And again, he is coming forward in May, along with a butcher, uh, Andrew Peter from Inverurie. In, in Perth, they will be looking at the Scottish Meats um, competition, and they will be representing as a Aberdeen Shire. I wish them both well. We have the privilege of having... H.M. Sheridan in my constituency in Balata, a butcher who have for years has provided the produce for the royal family at Balmoral and can you continue to do so. But Sheridan doesn't just produce the, the meats for the royal family and is a royal war warrant um, uh, in respect of that. He's also taking his meats and produce out to the various farmers' markets too. And in West Hill, it is certainly appreciated because there is no butcher in West Hill, a population of over 11,000. So Mr Sheridan takes the meats um, from Ballater to West Hill and uh, certainly is enjoyed by the people from that surrounding area. Presiding officer, not every town and village has a butcher, so we become reliant perhaps on our supermarkets. I have certainly been campaigning for months and so, partly since I've come to this Parliament, to try and ensure that local produce is in our supermarkets. Grown locally, produced locally, it should be sold locally. This takes into account the aspects of animal welfare and the fact that we don't have to transport our animals any further than they need to be. But what's disappointing, presiding officer, is the fact that when you look along the shelves in our supermarkets, Scottish produce is not the, 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 uh, in, in terms of the major product within the supermarket. Recently, I wrote to Tesco's to, to complain that only 28% of lamb was Scottish. The rest came from New Zealand. Presiding officer, this is a scandal. We have some of the best products, meats, lambs, poultry, fish, in here in Scotland. We should, and I think that Alex Ferguson uh, alluded to this, try to put more pressure on our supermarkets to ensure that they are producing, they are selling local produce for the people within our communities. Presiding officer, once again, can I congratulate Nigel Don for bringing forward this motion, and I certainly support it. Many thanks. Now call on Liam MacArthur, after which we'll move to the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I would to congratulate uh, Nigel Don. Unfortunately, the entirely less digestible uh, Audit Advisory Board meeting yesterday prevented me attending uh, the lunchtime uh, event, but I am delighted to be participating uh, in uh, today's debate. Um, as Nigel Don himself explained, the motion was lodged during the midst of the horse meat scandal, and as Alex Ferguson has always also referred to, there was a great deal of gallows humour amongst the seriousness of that issue. And on that note, I look forward to putting a couple of quid on Findus Crispy Pancake 
in the Sands Hotel handicap chase during the Bury Football Club race night on Saturday. If there is a silver lining to this scandal, however, it is the strong demand that local butchers um, ha have seen in their business uh, as a result in, in, in Orkney. Uh, that has been very much uh, the case. However, supermarkets will and must uh, look again at their supply chain, which will present uh, challenges. But I take some comfort from the remarks of Patrick Wall, the uh, former chief executive of the Irish uh, Food Standards Agency, who said, if there is a review of the supply chain management, there's a huge opportunity for Orkney. Orkney is the role model uh, for the rest of Europe uh, to aspire to. And we are very fortunate in the islands to have a range of uh, good local butchers, Craigie's, Lobins, Williamson's, Fletts, Donaldson's, Sinclair's, uh, the Doombe butcher. Doubtless I've missed uh, one or two off. Uh, but they've had to cope not just with uh, the consequences of uh, the horsemeat scandal, but also, as the Cabinet Secretary will be well aware, uh, the demise of Orkney meat as well. The dif difficulties of, of, uh, of Orkney meat uh, were uh, fairly long-lasting. They resulted from the cost of disposal of waste off-island, uh, the uh, what, things that were happening in terms of the, the beef market generally, uh, but also, I think, the problems that were being experienced by independent butchers further south, many of them who were customers of Orkney meat. But it is inconceivable that Orkney would be left without a killing facility, and I very much welcome uh, the efforts that were made, and at least helped by, uh, uh, by Richard Lockhead, in pulling together a consortium, a cooperative of local butchers, who are maintaining that despite the competition between them, uh, but recognising that there is a need to safeguard the Orkney brand, to maintain supplies, not just to the local market, but beyond that as well. And I'm delighted that uh, has continued apace. And there are opportunities flowing from that, uh, but I think um, it, there are issues uh, to be faced in relation uh, to capacity. So often Craigie from ER and T. Craigie uh, in Orkney suggests it would be impossible to kill the beasts and process them uh, with the current capacity. Uh, I wouldn't like to say we could never do it, but it would need a fresh look at how we meet that capacity. So with those opportunities do come uh, challenges. Deputy President Officer, in this place we, we often rail against red tape uh, and bureaucracy, and, and not without good reason uh, on occasion. But horse, the horsemeat scandal has offered, I think, a telling insight into the other side of the equation. Uh, we must always be balanced and proportionate in the way we apply, but no one can be in any doubt uh, about the benefits of rigorous traceability. As Thorfinn Craigie himself um, testifies, the paperwork may be massive, but as he says, uh, we have full traceability, and that's absolutely crucial. I think the, pr the problem arises, as Alex, uh, Alex Ferguson intimated, in the lack of a level uh, playing field. And I know there's huge frustration amongst the local butchers in Orkney uh, that they are under many, many requirements, that the implications for local farmers, even minor non-compliance, uh, could even be the, the loss of uh, the single farm payment. And yet the horsemeat scandal has illustrated that the same rigour has not been applied at the cheaper end of the market. This must change. Again, Professor Wall suggests that major retailers wanted the consumer recognition that comes with quality assurance schemes, uh, but were less prepared to pay suppliers uh, the extra money to cover the costs of that. Uh, I, I quote him in saying, hopefully they have learned a lesson that by forcing prices down, they only incentivise criminal activity. Uh, it's right that Parliament's had an opportunity to highlight the high quality service provided by local butchers, not just in Orkney, not just in Angus and the Mayans, uh, but right across the country. Uh, I congratulate Nigel Don again on bringing this debate uh, to the Parliament and for his other activities uh, this week. These have been difficult times, but hopefully there is cause for optimism looking ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead. Seven minutes, please. <coughs> All Thank, by. Thank you. Can I firstly commend the member for Angus North and Mearns, Nigel Dawn, for organising this debate and also Tuesday's Farmers Market event held in the Parliament's restaurant to which many of us attended. It was certainly an enjoyable event. Uh, there was a lot of people turned out to it, and of course it showcased uh, a wide variety of products that Scotland's producers and processors have to offer. And I certainly was there myself, purchased some burgers and sausages, and even had a couple of the pork sausages this morning for breakfast from Gorgie City Farm, not too far from here, and they were absolutely fantastic, just summing up the quality you get from uh, our local producers. And I should say at the outset, I noted John Mason's comments about the food at receptions in the Scottish Parliament. Perhaps there is a case for making that more local. I should point out, of course, I'm sure the Deputy Presiding Officer is paying close attention to that point because it's a responsibility of the Presiding Officers in Parliament, uh, and I'm sure he'll take that point away. But each farmer's market uh, is, of course, unique in its own character, but Nigel Dawn has, of course, made a valid point previously in this chamber regarding the need for such events to be held indoors. 
And we all know the weather in Scotland is not always the best, and holding our farmers' markets indoors may well be a way to further encourage the people of Scotland to buy even more local food and direct from the producers. And that's certainly something we'll be keen to look at as part of our new Think Local initiative, which we're funding at Scottish Government level to encourage more local produce to be made available to local consumers uh, throughout Scotland and to help fund uh, any local initiatives uh, with that aim in mind to come forward. Just over a month ago, we were in this chamber debating the achievements of our first ever national food and drink policy. And of course, when we had that debate, I was struck at the great pride members from right across the political spectrum took when highlighting the many success stories in their own constituencies, local food and drink sectors. And I have certainly visited many of the, the butchers in various constituencies across the country that we mentioned in today's debate. Uh, and of course, members were right at that point to be proud, very proud of what businesses of all sizes, the length and breadth of Scotland, uh, have achieved over the past few years. And we do all hope that success story of promoting local food in Scotland, uh, not just in terms of selling it locally, but also exporting it and giving it to other markets, uh, continues for the future. We are seeing that demand for local food and drink increase year on year. Uh, and that's despite some of the myths and also the economic climate. And that's really good news and a big vote of confidence in the quality and reputation of Scottish food. But that long-established trend over the past few years, of course, as, as members have said quite rightly, has been given fresh impetus on the back of the horsemeat scandal. And since that scandal broke, the Scottish Government, of course, has been working hard in partnership with the industry organisations to highlight the message that shoppers can have confidence in the Scotch label, where providence, traceability and quality are clear. Uh, and I certainly believe that's why so many people are now going to our local butchers compared to uh, just last year. There is now a boom in local butcher sales taking place in Scotland, as illustrated by many of the anecdotes from members. Some butchers have reported sales have gone up by more than a fifth since January. Others are saying by 30%. I've heard even higher percentages, and that's really good news. And that does reflect the fact that local butchers have a long-established relationship with farmers and know every step that their meat takes before reaching their customers' plates. Yes, Mr. Mr. Roberts, intervention. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for taking your intervention. The Cabinet mm -hmm. Secretary uh, acknowledged that many of our uh, farmers are becoming very diverse in the sale of their produce, uh, looking at different ways of actually selling their produce, but opening their doors to people who are actually non-meat eaters as well. I am certainly aware of butchers who are producing uh, pasties, etc., which are perhaps cheese and leek for vegetarians and uh, other such goods. So we have got to congratulate our, our, our butchers for actually producing non-meat products too. Cabinet Secretary. It's certainly the case that many of our local butchers are innovative and it's also very encouraging that so many local butchers, again as members have said, continue to populate our high streets. And it's certainly the case in my constituency and I visit all my local butchers regularly uh, as it is elsewhere in the country. And of course, one reason why they are still on our high street despite some of the trends of recent years is they do innovate for explaining the story behind their produce to, to customers and taking other steps uh, as well, so they deserve their success. At this point, of course, I should mention that, of course, the supply of meat to our butchers is very important, and that is why our livestock sector is so important in Scotland. And given the impact of the recent weather on particular sheep farmers, I hope we can use this debate to even further encourage Scottish consumers to get behind our sheep farmers and livestock farmers by purchasing even more Scotch lamb uh, and Scotch beef uh, as well at this particular time to support them in their hour of need. I think that's an important point to make during this debate. I should say in terms of butchers, the uplift in demand for their produce uh, also is leading to an increase in demand for skilled butchers in this country. And that is an issue which Skills Development Scotland are now turning their attention to. They are working in tandem with Meat Training Council to deliver modern apprenticeships uh, in meat processing skills. So let's not forget this is an industry that gets very uh, specific skills that have to be uh, encouraged and we have to encourage our young people to take up training uh, and opportunities uh, in our local butchers. We are actually supporting 252 modern apprenticeship posts right across Scotland from Sunra to Shetland and everywhere in between uh, and that is good news and there are other initiatives been taking as well. But the horsemeat scandal is not yet behind us as further cases of contamination continue to be uncovered by the extensive testing regime that we introduced. And of course, the Scottish Government is looking for further action at European level as well. So I do hope that consumers across Scotland continue to give support to their local butchers. A recent survey by Cantar says that 46% of consumers say they will change their purchasing behaviour as a result of the horsemeat scandal. And I do hope that that behaviour continues to be the case, that people will support even more local produce 
uh, in their local communities. I will continue to do what I can as Food Minister to support the local food agenda. We are investing a million pounds in the Think Local campaign. We have set up a community food fund also to help promote Scotland's rich larder right across this country. Uh, and we are also uh, making a million pounds available in the next three years to provide target assistance to local food, food networks and communities. That will give them the opportunity to show their wares to an even wider audience and build on that reputation we have been celebrating during this debate. There is so much more I can speak about to the Deputy Officer, but I just want to congratulate all our local butchers uh, on their success. Uh, and continue to sell the message to our consumers in Scotland to look for the Scotch label uh, and to understand that by visiting the local butcher they can have an assurance of good quality produce backed up with integrity and providence and of course it tastes absolutely fantastic as evidenced by the farmers market that took place in the Scottish Parliament on uh, Tuesday and I hope we see more of that in the future and I congratulate Nigel Dawn on this important debate once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would finally add that while I share the Cabinet Secretary's view that the Scottish Parliament should be using Scottish food and indeed showcasing Scottish food, uh, the food that is available in the Scottish Parliament is a matter for the corporate body and not the presiding officers on a point of information. I now close this debate. Thank you all.